Science has been one of the most influential forces in modern society, but it's a subject that is rarely the focus of fictional film. This video is sponsored by Audible. You might think I'm overlooking the science fiction genre, but the influence of science on the genre is often contained to constructing a setting for an otherwise traditional story. Rarely are scientists and the scientific process actually given the spotlight. Often science fiction is examining the outcome of a specific technology, science applied, instead of the scientific process involved with discovering or producing that technology. To see an example of this, you have to look no further than modern science fiction Twilight Zone Black Mirror, which is hardly concerned with the actual science of what it presents, merely the social and individual ramifications of those technologies, sometimes to the level of caricature. In fact, much of how science and scientists are presented in film involves some level of caricature. We often see scientists as crazed madman, or science as voluntarily or involuntarily spawning some kind of monster or hero. Consider the common theme of superheroes or villains created in a lab by accident. Science is an out of control force directed by irresponsible scientists, and whether what it produces is a force for good or evil is a product of chance. Even when the scientist's creation of a hero is more measured and intentional, that scientist is presented as a self-absorbed egomaniac. Scientists often merely exist to spout exposition when needed, or as the pawns of those who hold the real power. Even films that seem to give science a closer examination, paying a lot of lip service to its name. If you want to talk science, you gotta record the facts, analyze, get to the how and the why, then present your conclusions often end up casting it aside in favor of other answers to the story's central conflict. Love is the one thing we're capable of perceiving that transcends dimensions of time and space. Maybe we should trust that, even if we can't understand it yet. I'm not saying that all these films are bad because they portray science in this way, but why is this? Why is the scientific process so often overlooked in film? Science fiction author Aldous Huxley in his essay Literature and Science examines the divide between science and the literary arts. Talking about authors, he says, They have not been greatly interested in the science as a set of logically coherent hypotheses validated operationally by experiment and dispassionate observation, and in the field of applied science, their concern has been mainly with the social and psychological consequences of advancing technology, very little with its working or its underlying theories. Huxley's words could be describing the tech film that is fascinated with the interpersonal drama surrounding the creation of a technology more than with the creation of the tech itself. But you might say, logically coherent hypotheses and dispassionate observation are not the grounds for great stories. Stories are about passion, feeling, and emotion. And you might be right. Huxley goes on to describe how both science and literature use language to describe things, but it's the nature of what each needs to describe that's different. The language of science seeks for clarity and purity in terms of specificity. It seeks to describe what Huxley calls public experiences, or those experiences that are external and in that way shared by individuals. The literary artist takes a different approach, using language to accurately portray private experiences. The world with which literature deals is the world in which human beings are born and live and finally die. The world in which they love and hate in which they experience triumph and humiliation, hope and despair. The differing goals create a challenge when presenting science in film. Reconciling the two is no easy task, but it's one that Huxley thought was possible. One step, something that Huxley suggests to authors in his essay, is to include more relevant science within the work itself. And you can see this happening more and more frequently. Multiverse theory has been explicitly useful for certain stories, for Interstellar, Christopher Nolan drew heavily on cutting-edge science to produce accurate visualizations of a black hole. But fear might creep into the filmmaker that the science included in the film will become outdated, making the film feel irrelevant in a way it might not if the details were kept more vague. Or a filmmaker might worry that those details will be inaccurate, making the story feel immediately irrelevant to those who are more scientifically knowledgeable. And so filmmakers focus on portraying and discussing the emotional, philosophical, and relational fallout that the effects of science and technology have had, and rarely focus on the science itself. Or they sidestep the science in favor of a pseudo-metaphysical solution. But this doesn't account for the entire separation. Huxley's essay was partially written in response to a lecture given by scientist and novelist C.P. Snow called The Two Cultures, 
in which he described a cultural divide between scientists and authors. At that time, there was little crossover between the fields of professional artist and scientist. And it makes sense, the level of dedication needed to be a good scientist and a good artist are high enough that taking on both is unrealistic for most. But I think the cultural separation that Snow observed is slowly closing, as Huxley hoped it would. Literature now has many good examples of that gap being bridged, and recently film has given us some stories where science itself has played a larger role. Let's examine a few of those. By coming at it from the back end, see, rather than changing the surrounding temperature, we'll just change the level that it'll conduct, the transition temperature. Primer imagines the creation of a time machine as if it were invented in a garage like the personal computer. Much attention is paid to the progression of decisions and ideas that lead to the discovery of the actual machine and the subsequent tests. This is how we get protein A out of aspergillus to core. We sweeten it, we agitate it, we spin it around, we sweeten some more. It takes about a month. Do you get the same amount I brought? It's a rare moment when the process of discovery itself takes center stage ahead of even character development. Primer's depiction of science can also help us see that the issue is not always that most movies don't accurately depict science, but that most movies don't attempt to depict the process at all. Regardless of how dubious the science of Primer might be, the attention it gives to the process of invention is unique. And the fact that writer and director Shane Carruth is an engineer turned filmmaker is no surprise. In the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm gonna have to science the sh out of this. The Martian might be the film that does the best job of bridging the divide between science and film. The movie itself is interested in the details. Now I have hundreds of liters of unused hydrazine at the NDD. If I run the hydrazine over an iridium catalyst, it'll separate into N2 and H2. And then if I just direct the hydrogen into a small area and burn it. Much of the science shown in the film is accurate and science becomes the hero of the story. Luckily, I'm a botanist. The scientist, the person who is able to overcome adversity and triumph. Antonio sent me ahead with the scans. He's still busy in Kenwood. Bringing his men. Where's Antonio? It's still growing aggressively. The Fountain doesn't depict much science itself, but it's a unique film in that it's almost completely about a scientist and the act of science. Instead of turning the scientist into an adventurer, or presenting spirituality as something that overcomes science, it uses those images to show science as a spiritual endeavor and an adventure on its own. Instead of showing love as the thing that works when science has failed, love is the very thing that motivates the scientific act. These films show us ways that the divide can be bridged, and I think there's plenty of room for more of this type of exploration. One response I've seen to this discussion is that the reason for the lack of depicted science may have to do with the mundane nature of the majority of scientific endeavors, but I don't buy the theory. Filmmakers are great at making otherwise boring things appear interesting. And I'm not insinuating that science is necessarily superior to things like human endurance or love. These very things are often what fuels the progression of science itself. I think the romanticism of art works as a check and balance against the threat of scientific hubris. You can see the less than positive images of the scientist shifting as society's fears about what it might produce change. As the ringing the bomb left in culture's ears is fading, our focus turns to new, more pressing concerns. The dialogue between film and science might be more important than we think. I've been focusing on science's influence on film, but it goes both ways. Science fiction films make it into scientific papers from time to time, and those films play a role in shaping the kind of scientific development and technology that society comes to want and expect. Research even suggests that cinematic depictions of space travel helped shape public opinion about its viability, helping make it possible to fund those endeavors. Science isn't going to become any less influential in the future. And so finding more accurate and nuanced ways to tell stories about it couldn't hurt. Even attempting to tell those stories at all, as has so rarely been done, is a noble endeavor. 
This video was largely inspired by Huxley's essay, and I've been a little obsessed with his writing lately. His book Brave New World is an essential read, and I'm happy to say that you can get it for free as an audiobook when you use my link audible.com slash thomasflight, or text thomasflight to 500-500 and sign up for a 30-day free trial. I love Audible, and I'm happy to have them sponsoring this video. I always hear people talking about how great audiobooks are for commutes and workouts, and they are, but they complement so many activities. Make your summer better by pairing some great audiobooks with a hike, some time on the beach, or a road trip. When you sign up for Audible, you get a book a month. For your first month, I'm recommending Brave New World. Huxley sets the story in a dystopian future, but instead of highlighting the danger of a government-imposed dystopia like Orwell shows us in 1984, Huxley shows us a dystopia created by technology that the inhabitants unwittingly welcome upon themselves. It's a story that I think is absolutely relevant to today. Whatever book you choose is yours to keep, and that's something I love about Audible. The books you get are yours forever. Sometimes I've gone back and re-listened to books that I enjoyed two or three times, and if you're ever unhappy with a book, you can swap it out for another one. You really have no excuse not to give Audible a try. So use my link www.audible.com slash thomasflight or text thomasflight to 500-500 to get a free audiobook and 30-day trial. I'm listening to audiobooks all the time, so if you have any recommendations, let me know in the comments. Thank you everyone for watching this video. I really appreciate your views and your support. And as always, thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. Go to patreon.com slash thomasflight to find out more about how you can help me continue making videos for a long time to come.